It is a noble endeavor to begin with the end in mind. In the shadow of Table Mountain, hedge fund managers, professional money managers, people who invest on behalf of pension funds, insurance companies, foundations and endowments, they ply their trade, as it is with any beautiful city in the world, because investment managers are knowledge workers. They can pretty much invest from anywhere on the planet as long as they have a really good internet connection and a nice view, preferably a place for their yachts to park in the afternoon. <laughs> but the question that I'd like to introduce into the TED community, the voice that I'd like to add to this global conversation, is a question about investing as if the future matters. Unless you invest, and unless I invest, we're not setting aside assets that can accumulate and that we can access later in our lives. And unless we invest, and we're mindful of where those assets are invested and the impacts those assets are having, then we're probably creating a future that look, looks a lot like today, and probably a lot worse. If we don't explicitly ask that environmental, social, and governance factors, as well as every other factor is used to accurately assess the quality of an investment, how that investment will perform over time, what companies or projects are being invested in. Unless we ask that ESG factors are included in our investments, they probably aren't. And then that very future that we inspire each other with in the TED community, that's probably not going to happen. The first six TED Talks were put online in 2006. TED itself has been running global conferences since 1990. In November 2012, TED Online reached over 1 billion views. Now, when I hear those amazing numbers of this wonderful global conversation, looking at innovation and ideas, shaping the future, brilliant people doing amazing things, I ask a simple question, why? Why are these people, these viewers, these speakers, these new, fresh minds looking towards the future, why are they not investing as if the future matters? Because in my world, in the professional investment management world, we're not seeing that future come through. There's a great opportunity to have an impact. And today, what I'd like to offer you into this conversation is my big idea. My big idea is firstly, and you've been told this since you're in high school, start thinking about the long term. Get investing. That's the small part of the big idea. The bigger part is make sure when you make those investments that you're mindful and you're trusting but verifying that where those investments are being put are being put to create a future that looks a lot different than today. Let me start by giving you a window into my world. This is a photograph from an institutional investment conference held in Cape Town, South Africa. It's an organization, a voluntary organization, of major pension funds, insurance companies, endowments, and the people that run them trying to come together to figure out how can we invest as good fiduciaries? How can we find bridges and roads and hospitals to invest in? How can we make sure we include environmental, social, and corporate governance factors in the strategies and in the portfolios that we're investing in? It was an important event. It was the first time ever it was held in Africa. And this event has been held in other major emerging markets around the world. There are, according to statistics, around 62 trillion US dollars invested professionally today. 62 trillion. Well, around 25 trillion US dollars in assets were represented at this very conference. 25 trillion in assets of people of investors, people like you and me, putting our assets together into pension funds or funding insurance policies, 25 trillion in assets looking to invest proactively with environmental, social, and governance factors. Well, I'm a critical thinker, so let me add an asterisk there. It's self-reported. We need to trust but verify that investors who claim that they're including ESG factors, environmental, social, and governance factors, are actually doing that. But here's your good news. There is actually voluntary activity looking to pull these investors together and to get more capital invested that proactively include ESG. That's really happening. That's some of the good news. That gets us down the path. But there's a flip side to that story that I'd like to share with you. 
This is a photograph from Accra, Ghana, a photograph I took in May 2011. We had a major private equity conference. At this conference, it was packed. The room was packed, 500 plus people in smart looking black suits in the air conditioned hall, which you really need in West Africa. When our uh, taxi had a puncture, and I turned around, I was taking a photograph. If you look carefully, you can actually see the signs nailed into the tree, kind of a Google AdWords, a simple technology version. I was taking a photograph of that when this man walked in front of me, let's call him Kwame, walked in front into the frame and I snapped the shot. And on the flight home, after this major investment conference, looking at investing in frontier and emerging markets and new businesses, opening up Africa, myth or reality as the final investment frontier, I thought to myself, how do we get more money, more investment, more finance to people like Kwame? Here's someone who's not lounging about watching the Champions League rerun. He's not watching Oprah. I'm not sure he'd ever watch Oprah, but not watching a soap opera. No, he, he got up that day. He put on his sandals on a hot West African day, and he walked the busy streets of Accra collecting scrap metal on a cart, manually. He's literally putting his idea into action. He is a self-starter. He is an entrepreneur in the best sense of the world. I'd even argue to the greenies out there, he's a green entrepreneur because his net carbon footprint is looking pretty good. He's walking and recycling. That's pretty good, people. How do we get more investment capital to people like Kwame? Well, some of your good news today is as we stand here, we're able to do things we weren't able to do a decade ago. We now have portfolios where the blend of financial return to environmental return to social return, there's a blend and there are different options. You can uh, apply the so-called impact investing, where you look to dial up the environmental or social impact. Some people have targeted there might be $1 trillion in 10 years' time invested in this particular theme. That's not for everyone. I'm not suggesting every pensioner should look to do that, no. But there is opportunity as my profession, the investment management profession, starts thinking more proactively and thoughtfully about where some of these assets are going. And this is a global story. You can find a Kwame in Shanghai, in Sao Paulo, in Sydney, definitely in Detroit. If we get this right, there's so much more we're getting right. I promise to touch on very quickly reminding you what you already know. Let me talk to you about the adult marshmallow test. You might have heard of uh, Walter Mischel, the uh, Stanford psychology professor who performed a study on children. And it's a terrible torture for these children. He puts them in a room and he gives them one marshmallow. And he says, if you don't eat this marshmallow, and he comes back 15 minutes later, if you don't eat this marshmallow, I'll give you two. Now, for those of you who have a toddler who can remember your young age, well, the adult equivalent is two hours waiting for your first coffee in the morning, okay? That's a lifetime, right? <laughs> the adult marshmallow test is having the personal financial discipline to say, I will defer some of my spending today to invest that I can access in future. I can be kind to my future self because I've been very diligent about saving over time. This marshmallow test for adults is a test that so few of us are as diligent as we could be. And, and I, I'm one of you, I, I stand there too. I could have done better. So my encouragement to you today, part of my big idea, is begin investing. If you are invested, invest more. Start tomorrow. Get online today. You unlock not just a positive personal financial behavior, but you unlock, studies show, a new positive personal dynamic. You create a positive dynamic where you, are, you mentally understand subconsciously that you're backing your future self. Compound interest. The thing that works against you when you're trying to get yourself through college by uh, getting student loans, when you're maybe trying to buy furniture, when maybe you're fortunate enough to look about uh, investing a car or, or, or buying a home, that compound interest that hurts you because the debt compounds and, and weighs on you, well, that's the thing that can work for you the longer you invest. So when I talk about investing, I'm trying to encourage you to save little parcels of money over time for the longest possible period. It's no good investing for a while and then cashing out and then interrupting and then starting again. You never access what I like to call the eighth wonder of the world, compound interest. On this chart, I want you to pick up the three vectors. The green uh, uh, triangle 
is simply accumulating $100 since 1970. It's the same year a lot of what became Earth Day was formed. That's why I chose it. It's a great year. The red geometric shape is what happens when you compound that at 4% annually, 0.33% monthly. And the blue triangle is what happens when you try to catch up with that. If you say, instead of starting in 1970, you started in 1990, the year of the first global TEDs, and you try to catch up. Instead of investing $100 a month, you'd have to invest $300 a month. Yes, you would catch up, but it would be so much harder. So that's a key learning, and you'd want to take that away. A personal insight into how I came to think about sustainable investment. Why, apart from approaching any kind of long-term investment, is it so important to think about the environmental, social, and governance factors that you should be looking to include? Well, this is an excellent uh, screenshot. I, I think it's a fantastic wallpaper. It's an actual photograph from the Cassini spacecraft passing Saturn's rings. And that little dot which you can't see, that's planet Earth. Look at it online. Well, there's a story called the Lorax that I remember when I was in grade three. I watched and I, I drew a little drawing and I wrote a little story for my teacher. The Lorax is a story about unless. It's about unbridled industrialization, a businessman who's greedy, he uses up the truffle trees. I, I don't mean the fancy CGI version. I watched the classic 1971 version, okay? It's even, even better. And it's a story, the Lorax, about being mindful and thoughtful about what are the consequences of your actions. When I work with uh, institutional investors as an ESG architect, I'm looking to encourage them that they look at all factors, including environment, social, and governance factors. Because in my view, we live in the Anthropocene era. Literally, scientists are looking to re-describe this geologic period that we are in since in industrialization as the Anthropocene. Humans are literally shaping the Earth. We've cut the isthmus of Central America. We cut Africa off from the Middle East. We can see a wall humans built from space. We've changed the seas. We're changing the skies. We live in the Anthropocene era. If you are making long-term investments and you're not thinking about how different the future will be, unless. And here's another example. A photograph taken underwater near Cape Town, South Africa by John Tresfond. This is what an externality looks like. I know it's difficult to look at. It's tough. This is a Cape fur seal pup playing, having fun, but it's not going to play out well. Well, there's externalities of every decision that you make in your life. It's true. How you buy things, where you live, who you vote for. But the part that I often find missing from the TED conversation is where you invest your money, who you buy those investment services from, which uh, uh, financial services firms you look to, to, to lend, or where you put your investments, where they're invested, and how you track them over time. What are the externalities of your investment decisions? This is a cartoon from one, an iconic South African cartoonist called Zapira. I love it for two reasons. One is it was taken around COP17 held in Durban, South Africa, the annual UN negotiation about carbon emissions, talking about how do we regulate externalities. Good news, there's some progress. We're trying to get some rules in the game. Bad news is this conference could run for 1,000 years because the delegates love negotiating with each other. The good news is investors were at this event. We ran a side event for institutional investors outside of the formal event, even as Zapiro identified. You had a situation where we, in this cartoon where they kind of ring-fenced out from the poker players. Well, I'd give you two insights, one better than the other. I think Zapiro missed representing the seventh player would be big investors. The good news is the big investors are investing in all those organizations represented. Big investors buy into countries when they buy their sovereign bonds. Big investors buy into big oil or big gas where they buy their shares. That's why BP fell 15% in the weeks following the Mokondo well disaster. And secondly, you, as the TED community, are in that cartoon because you are those people who are standing outside looking in. You are the pension fund members. You are the people who are investing through the life insurance policies. It's your assets that are being professionally managed by other people. We do have more opportunity now, day two, to speak up. This is an actual graphic, an image from a confrontation between an NGO speaking to institutional investors and companies, asking what are you doing about stakeholders? What are you doing about communities that are being deprived? 
And what are you doing about water that needs to be made available to more people in the communities where the companies, the mines were invested, and the investors investing in those mines? So there is more opportunity. The other good news that you'll want to hear is that there is more data. This is a picture of how the world looks to someone who's looking to integrate ESG data today. Well, 10 years ago, we dreamed of an image like this, of a world where there was actual data in different countries on companies and what they're doing. Now, to be sure, we have different levels of data, different quality of data. We have less environmental data than social data. We have the most governance data. It makes sense. If you're an investor, you're most nervous about seeing your money again, right? Governance issues. So the trend is good, but if you look carefully, you'll see there's less than one-third in any listed market that we have ESG data for. A good start, so much more to do. Coming into land then, I want you to tackle the two uh, uh, pushbacks I often receive. The first is, what are you doing uh, about measuring the impact? And the first point I'd have to you is, what is the investment legacy that you're leaving behind? You are part of the investment value chain. When you're buying something, you're buying something from a company that has investors. When you're investing, you're part of a pension fund. Well, where is that pension fund looking to invest its money? You have an investment legacy. I know a famous cyclist, brilliant athlete, greatly respect him. Unfortunately, because of the approach he took, that man has no legacy in the cycling world today. And finally, this question of performance. More and more data is demonstrating we have a mixed picture. A key message I'd want you to walk away from today is that integrating environment, social, and governance factors will not necessarily lead to underperformance. That's a myth that you can, you can forget. Integrating ESG factors may, in fact, create outperformance. I'm not going to say that. There's too, too much difficulty and challenge in analyzing investment returns. This year's Nobel Prize winner in economics, one of three, Eugene Farmer, says you need 35 years of data. We don't have that yet in the ESG field. But what I would put to you, that integrating ESG factors may help you understand a company better, invest in better quality management, and reduce the risks that you might be facing. It might actually reduce the cost of capital that you'll be investing in. And so let me end now with the, the future I'd like to see. I work in the investment management industry, and it's had a whole lot of bad press, at least since 2007 in the global financial crisis. I'd like to make investment management a noble profession, but we need help, and you can be that help, and you need to be investing for the long term. So in the words of Jerry Maguire, let me help you. <laughs> we need you to be investing for the long term. If you don't invest for the long term, you have no skin in the game. You're not helping yourself to grow those assets over time. But if you invest, and you are part of the investment value chain today as you sit here, and tomorrow as you invest that capital, if you do not invest and explicitly include environmental, social, and governance factors, you're investing in a future that probably doesn't matter. Help me to help you. Unless you invest for the long term, unless you include environmental, social, and governance factors, we will not see the future that we as the TED community dream of, innovate towards, and hopeful. Thank you.